Carlo will speak first and Totti second. So I don't know if you noticed, but originally it was the opposite. So if you didn't notice, it's the same. And uh, if you don't, it's changed. OK, so please, Carlo, if you want to stay. So, um, to uh, begin, I would like to come back in more details to what I was um, doing at the end of my second lecture. We were doing um, a, a proof of uh, Wiskan's theorem following a, a simplified argument uh, based on um, more recent results. And um, so, since at the end I, I skipped some steps that uh, are quite meaningful, I wish to come back in more detail to the conclusion of that proof. Uh, so let me recall you what we were doing. We were starting from um, M0 in Rn plus 1, um, closed, uh, smooth, and convex. Then uh, we know that there exists uh, the evolution by mean curvature MT, flow by mean curvature of M0, which uh, remains convex. And is defined for T up to some uh, uh, singular time capital T, which is finite. Then we also know that um, the um, maximum on MT of the curvature blows up as uh, the curvature becomes unbounded as uh, T goes to the singular time. Um, let me uh, make a simple remark. Um, we have these um, two quantities related to square curvature. One is uh, the um, modulus of the second fundamental form, uh, which uh, when it is squared, that is just the sum of the squares of the principal curvatures. And uh, if we compare it with um, squared of the mean, square of the mean curvature, you see that one is the sum of the squares, the other one is the square of the sums. And um, how, or what's the relation between these two? We have that uh, by the, the elementary inequality relating uh, these two operations, uh, we have, um, this is always true. Um, on the other hand, if uh, we are on a convex manifold, uh, so non-negative uh, um, curvatures, then uh, uh, We have also that uh, a reverse inequality in this way because uh, when you when you compute the, the square, you have uh, all these terms which appear here plus the uh, mixed products, uh, and uh, if the these numbers are positive, the mixed products are positive. So this is going to be larger than this, and um, so on. Um, convex uh, class of surfaces, really these two are comparable. So if I say this is going to infinity, then also this is going to infinity. So uh, I can uh, state, I can exchange the, the two quantities in uh, these statements. OK, um, so another thing we had seen is that um, 
there is uh, some positive epsilon such that uh, this holds on mt for all t up to the singular time. So we have this uniform pinching, which, uh, um, well, if we put an h, then it is an invariant uh, property, but so then we can also state it in this way with some uniform epsilon. And um, this uh, gives, um, the, there is the, we have seen there is a result by, on convex sets that says that uh, um, the inner, the in radius of um, our evolving surface is, um, cannot become too, I say in this way, it's, um, let's put it in this way. Mm. Let me, I mean, it's equivalent, but. I uh, think, no, of course, this is uh, equivalent, but no, I want to use the same, uh, the same inequality as yesterday. Okay, let me write it this way. Uh, so that way C is a small constant, the other way around, C is a large constant. Okay, so th th we had seen this yesterday. We have also seen by convexity that uh, if we fix some T0 uh, less than capital T, and um, if we call uh, um, y, y bar not the, the center of um, the center of uh, inscribed ball uh, inside uh, mt0 then uh, and if we let's call uh, let's give a name to this function if we set u equal to uh, f minus y not zero times the normal, then uh, uh, u pt is uh, greater than or equal to rho minus of t zero uh, for all p for all uh, t less than or equal t zero. Um, yeah, there is this um, contracting character that has the, the flow in this case. So if, um, basically, uh, in my lectures as well as in uh, Gerhard's lecture, uh, we, when we have positive curvature, that the flow always go in the same direction. And um, therefore, for instance, in particular, you have that both rho plus and rho minus are uh, monotone, monotone decreasing. So if um, this ball is included at time t0, then uh, it is also included at previous times. So this holds for all times. Um, OK, then um, now I come in the, to the part which I'm going to um, discuss in more detail. Uh, let, uh, so to simplify notation, let uh, us introduce a letter for the half of this quantity. And um, uh, then uh, uh, we have the, the following estimate. Um, the, then we can um, define the following function. Define, uh, as I wrote yesterday, mm, sorry, u minus alpha. And uh, so the, the idea of taking this function was in, um, in one of the early paper on um, Gauss curvature flow. But it uh, turns out that um, uh, this function is um, very flexible. So for a wide uh, class of uh, curvature flow, if you consider the speed divided by 
support function minus a suitable constant, uh, in the case of convex set, uh, related to the in radius, then it uh, basically it gives you, you have an upper bound for the whole function, which in turn gives an upper bound on the speed, which is very useful. Um, then uh, one can uh, compute the, the um, okay, I, one can compute the evolution equation of this function. Uh, one can use the evolution equation for the mean curvature. And uh, computing the evolution equation for the support function is a, um, sort of an exercise in uh, hypersurface geometry. You, um, well, you, you use that uh, the evolution, you use that uh, f uh, has equal, derivative equal to mean curvature times the normal. Um, among the equation that Gerhard showed you, the time derivative of the normal is equal to the gradient of the speed, so in this case, gradient of the mean curvature. And then uh, the, um, uh, one can compute Laplace of this expression. So when one computes Laplace of the normal, one uses the Weingarten uh, relation, the Kodatsi equation. So at the end of standard computation, one finds uh, that uh, this uh, W evolves uh, according to this uh, uh, expression. Okay, we want to find a bound from above on, uh, on W. So we have to look at the reaction term. We have a positive term and a negative term. And um, so the, um, the, the point is that this denominator um, basically has a controlled size from above and from below because uh, we know that um, u is greater than or equal to, to alpha, so u minus alpha is uh, greater than or equal to alpha itself. Um, we have also an upper bound, but which we will need uh, uh, later. So, so having a denominator here doesn't change much the size of the, the set of this function. Also, having w is some more or less like having H. So the W behaves like uh, H, which in turn is comparable with uh, A. So basically, the, the positive term has uh, power 2 in the curvature, and the negative term has power 3 in the curvature. So when, um, for large curvature, which is a large W, this term should prevail. Uh, and. Uh, so prevent the curvature from uh, getting arbitrarily large. So let's uh, write it uh, more in detail. We have that um, term uh, alpha a square w divided by u minus alpha. Um, I reminded you before of this um, elementary inequality that alpha square is greater than h square over n. I, it's interesting to keep exact tract of the constant because alpha uh, includes the, the, in, the inner radius, which is going to play an important role in the following. Okay, then h square is, um, uh, h is the numerator in the definition of v. So this is also equal to um, alpha over n um, w to the 3, but we are missing one factor like this. So we have um, 
this equality, but I, as I was reminding you, this is uh, greater than alpha square over n w to the third. So uh, this means that uh, we can uh, write here this is uh, less than or equal to alpha square over n w to the third. So we have uh, obtained the structure we were looking for. And then um, by maximum principle, uh, it is clear. Um, you see, this is, um, we can rewrite this term as um, um, we can write it as alpha square over n w square minus w so this is the this term here uh, plus 2n over a square so you see that this term is um, so vanishes when w is equal to this value. And if w is greater than this value, this term is negative. So by using comparison with the ODE, you see that the maximum of w uh, on MT, if, uh, if it is um, larger than this, if it starts larger than this value, then it decreases. If it is uh, smaller, it can increase, but it cannot go beyond this uh, value. So uh, we obtain that uh, the maximum on MT over W is uh, less than the, so either the maximum at time zero or that constant there. Um, well, um, one would need a bit of a justification, but uh, to simplify, the, to, to, so to focus on the, well, um, so let me first observe, this shows in particular that um, um, it is uh, bounded by something which only depends on alpha and on the initial value. So uh, this implies uh, um, that uh, I remind you alpha is equal to so uh, Um, so th there is a um, further step that W is um, H divided by U minus alpha. This means that um, um, H at time T0 in particular is uh, less than or equal to uh, U At every point, we have this, um, this inequality times uh, this uh, max. Uh. Okay, but now we, uh, so we, we need a bound from above on this. Uh. Um, U is um, uh, by construction, so uh, you see that u can at most be as large as this, uh, the, the modulus of this vector, which in turn is bounded by the diameter of, uh, of our uh, uh, hypersurface. So this is um, less than or equal to, uh, it's not optimal, but uh, it's enough for our purposes, uh, um, is less than or equal to this. Um, uh, to the, the outer radius, uh, but the outer radius uh, is uh, controlled by the inner radius. So 
we have a bound on H time T0, which depends uh, only on the inner radius or on the initial value. Therefore, um, if the inner radius does not go to zero, H cannot go to infinity, and we cannot have a singular time. So if, uh, if the, the radius does not go to zero, then H does not go to infinity. But we know that this happens as, uh, for the, as a singular time. Uh, then uh, this means that rho minus of t goes to zero as uh, we reach the singular time. But rho plus uh, is less than constant times rho minus. Uh, it also goes to zero. So this shows, uh, as I was uh, already telling yesterday, that we have convergence to a point because uh, uh, the singular time, uh, well, if the outer radius is going to zero, then um, you are converging to a point. Now, a further observation that we can make uh, is, uh, I can uh, justify it better, that this uh, also implies uh, rho minus rho plus uh, are comparable radius uh, of a, of a sphere. So let um, so con consider, so let nt, the sphere, um, shrink in uh, at uh, the same time uh, uh, capital T and uh, uh, radius um, and, uh, and the same point uh, as uh, our hypersurface. Uh, as our hypersurface uh, MT. So you, we, we know that our, sorry, it should be convex. We know that our hypersurfaces are convex and are going to shrink to a certain point, uh, call it y, y bar. And then I consider the family of spheres which shrink uh, at the same point, the same time. We have an explicit expression for the radius of nt. Then nt has a, a radius. Um, so you know, a sphere has. Um, um, you know that a sphere has. Um, if it starts uh, with radius, uh, with some radius. Uh, rho zero square, then uh, the radius decays with this uh, rate. This has been uh, computed by Gerard, I guess. And um, so the singular time for the sphere is uh, rho zero square minus 2n. Uh, then we can also write this as uh, to n the singular time minus t. So, this is the precise expression for the for nt, and I claim that the picture has to be the one that I wrote, that mt has to cross uh, nt, to intersect nt for every time, because um, um, if it is uh, completely inside, 
then uh, by comparison it would uh, shrink at an earlier time. If it is completely outside, then it will shrink at a later time, then they have to intersect for all time. And then uh, we, we did use that um, the rho minus has to be less than this. And rho plus has to be greater than this. Because, uh, so if rho plus is smaller than, uh, um, well, actually, I'm not, this is not completely precise because the, the rho plus could be attained at a different, uh, at a different uh, center. But I mean, Again, by, by comparison argument with shrinking spheres, you, you obtain this. But since you know that this is in turn comparable with uh, uh, rho, rho minus, this means that uh, also a reverse estimate holds uh, up to constants independent of time. So this means that both rho minus and rho plus are of the order uh, square root of the remaining time, which um, is um, very close to the definition of type one. Type one singularity means that the curvature Decays, uh, like, uh, decays, blows up like the inverse of this. Uh, here we, we are talking about radii, not uh, the radii of the whole uh, uh, object, not of the uh, curvature at specific points, but we can go back to this estimate here. This shows that um, You recall, alpha was this one. So if uh, we let T0 go to, T0 go to capital T, then uh, alpha goes to, alpha goes to zero. Uh, then uh, this is, uh, the, the maximum of these two is uh, this one here then we have that uh, h of p t0 is less than or equal to, we have uh, a certain constant times uh, rho minus, then uh, this we can forget, and then we have another constant uh, uh, 2n over times 4, rho minus square, and so this is uh, some other constant over rho minus t0, but we know that this uh, behaves like a square root of the remaining time, so we have an estimate like this. And this is uh, just uh, the definition of uh, type one, uh, except we have H instead of uh, modulus of A, but we, uh, on a convex, uh, they are comparable. So once you have type one, then um, you have the classification of the rescalings that uh, Gerard uh, told you. Uh, you know that uh, uh, they are convex, therefore, of um, positive mean curvature, so you know that the rescaling is either a sphere or a cylinder or the product of an average longer curve times a flat factor. But um, you have um, this pinching. This is um, a scale invariant property, so it's um, inherited by the limit of rescalings. 
So the limit of rescalings uh, has to satisfy this pinching, and this prevents uh, uh, something which, is, uh, which has uh, flat factors. Therefore, uh, uh, the sphere, round sphere, has an only possible limit. So this is um, the way one can prove um, Huygens' theorem on convex hypersurfaces by using uh, um, the classification of uh, singularities given by the, of type one singularities given by the monotonicity formula and some uh, easy maximum principle arguments. Um, let me tell you something about uh, what was instead the original approach by Huygens because uh, we, are using, we are going to use similar ideas uh, for, the, for our next results. Um, so the, the first steps were to observe that convexity is preserved, that pinching is preserved, but the um, uh, key role was played by the, this uh, quantity here. This quotient, um, this quotient, we can subtract a constant. Then uh, we have, uh, let's call this expression F. Well, by the inequality I was recalling, um, uh, this quantity, uh, uh, F is uh, always positive, uh, is uh, zero if and only if uh, all curvatures are the same. And uh, one can uh, be more precise. Uh, one can show that uh, we have this nice expression that F is uh, really equal to the sum of uh, up to a factor of these uh, squares, over all uh, pairs of indices, i and j. So I take all uh, different principal curvatures, I divide them by h, and I take the square of the difference. I sum all these objects, and you can uh, easily check by some elementary computation that uh, uh, you obtain uh, this, uh, this expression here. Uh, which in particular shows uh, these properties above. So this um, function measures in a quantitative way how much the curvatures differ. And since we are dividing by h, we have uh, scale invariant quantities because um, when we look at the evolution, everything is shrinking. So the curvatures are increasing, are becoming infinite. And uh, we, we want to, so it's too much to expect that the curvatures curvature themselves uh, approach to each other because they are becoming larger. So the, the, the uh, studying the differences uh, is too difficult. But uh, if we divide them by, by h, then uh, this is a quantity which uh, is invariant on the scale. And so this measures uh, how um, the curvatures are close to each other up to a rescaling. Um, so the idea is uh, uh, if uh, the function is identically zero, then um, what does it mean? It means that all curvatures uh, coincide at every point, so every point is umbilical. And by some elementary result of Riemannian geometry, this also implies that their common value is uh, also independent of the point. Um, so, uh, and this is equivalent to say that we have a sphere. So the idea of Wisconsin was to show that uh, 
not that this fun somehow that this function uh, so not really so that in some sense it goes to zero as we approach uh, the singular time. Uh, the point is, in contrast to what we have uh, seen until now, this doesn't work by maximum principle alone. And um, what Huiskan showed was uh, by a uh, more difficult approach that we will uh, see later by integral estimates and uh, an iteration uh, procedure. Uh, so we can show that um, if uh, we take a small enough positive number sigma, then uh, h to the sigma times f is bounded up to uh, the singular time, so uh, which is a highly non-trivial property because uh, f, so f is a scale invariant, so we would expect it to remain as it is uh, as we reach the singularity. But this is going to infinity at least uh, somewhere. So this means that um, if um, h goes to infinity, uh, then uh, f goes to zero. So at, th at those points where uh, the curvature becomes larger and larger, then f goes to zero, then we somehow are approaching a sphere. Then one has to show, does this happen everywhere or just uh, at some part of the, of the um, uh, hypersurface? Um, well, we can uh, then prove the, a gradient estimate on, um, on this function f, uh, sh uh, no, not on this function, on the, on the curvature, showing again that um, if the curvature becomes large, then the gradient of the curvature compared to the scale becomes smaller. So having large curvature holds uh, in, uh, must hold in a larger and larger portion of uh, the hypersurfaces until you are able to say that uh, if it is enough large at one point, it is uh, comparably large on the whole hypersurface. Then you have f going to zero everywhere, and then uh, you converge to a sphere. So you can recognize a different uh, approach. Uh, you, here you really see that there is a something improving going to a sphere. In the previous argument, uh, we did not prove uh, any improving of the sphericity, so to say, of our uh, hypersurface. We just showed that everything goes uh, to the singular time with a certain behavior, which ensures type one. But then we know that by the monotonicity formula that the only possible type one are of a certain type and the only compatible one is the sphere. So there are two different ways of approaching the problem. Uh, one uh, thing that I would like to stress, uh, in both approaches I have uh, shown you, uh, they both need, uh, they only work in higher dimension. So the, in the, the previous approach, uh, remember I, there was this uh, lemma on convex sets uh, that showed if you have uh, curvature pinching, then you have a pinching on an inner and outer radii of the set. Uh, I forgot to say it explicitly, but this uh, can all, cannot, can only, does only make sense for n greater than one because uh, if n is equal one, then uh, there is uh, no pinching. I mean, you have only one curvature, which of course is comparable with itself, but this does not give any information of inner and outer radius. So that lemma on convex sets only holds for uh, hypersurfaces with dimension at least two. And also, Huiskan's approach uh, mm, in one dimension, this function becomes identically one, so there is, uh, it cannot longer tell you anything. 
Um, and uh, so the, the, this is um, a bit a strange situation because um, uh, usually you would expect the one-dimensional case to be easier that uh, technique for a higher dimensional case work in the one dimension but not the opposite and said for this result the techniques for the higher dimensional case do not work for the one dimensional case so the, the proof for the one dimensional case was uh, obtained by independent arguments for the first time, time by Gage and Hamilton Actually, I think it was even a bit later than uh, uh, Huiskens' result. And um, so Gage and Hamilton showed that, that convex curve shrinks to a point and becomes round. Then Grayson showed the further result, which only holds in one dimension, that any embedded curve uh, eventually becomes convex. Then you can apply Gage Hamilton to show convergence to a round point. And Grayson's theorem was the one that Gerard was uh, uh, showing you yesterday with this uh, two-point approach. Okay, so um, this um, is about uh, convex hypersurfaces, which is a nice result, but somehow um, this is the end of the story for convex hypersurfaces. Um, you wish to study more general hypersurfaces for the mean curvature flow. And um, a class that uh, we, has been extensively studied, as already mentioned by Gerard, is the class uh, of uh, mean convex, so that is with a positive uh, um, mean curvature. So suppose now uh, M0 uh, close the smooth uh, mean convex, uh, so with uh, H equal to 0. Uh, I wrote and I said it wrong, with h greater than 0. Um, again, I um, write for simplicity h greater than 0, but uh, if it is um, greater than or equal to by the strong maximum principle, it immediately becomes uh, uh, strictly positive everywhere. Uh, so what can we say about the singularities? This um, allows the neck pinch behavior I've showed you uh, in the first uh, lecture. So surely um, we, we cannot have just a round point as in the convex case. We can have more general uh, uh, profiles. And uh, the, um, uh, a key uh, result in this analysis is the one uh, Gerard was uh, stating today, which I say you again now, which is uh, um, so under this assumption, uh, uh, for every, so these are the convexity estimates, uh, for every positive eta, there exists some uh, constant C, C eta, uh, only depending uh, on eta and on the initial value. Uh, such that uh, the smallest uh, curvature, so the, the others uh, uh, as well, uh, uh, satisfy this estimate from below for every, so on uh, mt, for every t up to the singular time. So, um, so lambda 1 greater than or equal to 0 would be convexity. Here, uh, we never have really have convexity. We can only say lambda 1 is greater than something negative. Uh, the point is uh, that um, so lambda 1 uh, should scale uh, as uh, h. 
then uh, uh, we would expect, uh, if uh, nothing uh, special happens, that lambda 1 can in general blow up as fast as H uh, on the negative uh, side, uh, possibly, if, you, if we have no convexity restriction. But this shows that the negative part, of, if, if lambda 1 stays negative, then it cannot grow as fast as H, because uh, this eta is arbitrarily small. And so it, uh, it blows up slower than an arbitrarily small uh, um, multiple of uh, H. Uh, this is compensated by this uh, constant C eta, which becomes larger and larger as eta becomes small. So, of course, such an estimate is only interesting when uh, H goes to infinity. On any compact subinterval of uh, zero T, this is trivial because uh, by by compactness, uh, every smooth function is uh, greater than uh, constant negative enough. But it is completely non-trivial that we can find a constant up to capital T where both this and this uh, become unbounded, so it's uh, not clear that you can find a constant below. And the, in particular, this means, as uh, Gerard told you today, that uh, if we rescale, so corollary, uh, after rescaling, somehow after rescaling, these uh, go to so scale in the same way, but instead in the um, rescaling, this um, constant does not, uh, does not change while the, these two go to, so if we, after the rescaling, so that the curvatures which would become infinite stay bounded, and the constant uh, is decreased uh, by a uh, higher and higher factor in the rescaling, so we obtain uh, the same estimate uh, without the C eta for every eta greater than zero. Uh, but if we have the estimate without uh, the constant, uh, then uh, the arbitrariness of eta implies uh, that lambda 1 is greater than or equal to 0. And so it's, it means uh, that um, somehow the um, hypersurface becomes asymptotically convex near the singularities. So the, um, the possible negative uh, curvatures uh, become smaller and smaller compared to the positive ones. So in the limit of a rescaling, you only see the positive ones. The negative ones have, uh, uh, so either all curvatures are positive or some are zero, but, uh, and um, I want to, um, let me say something about this result. This result, was about the history, this was proved by uh, Huisken and myself uh, in a paper which appeared in 99. And um, basically at the same time, although the paper appeared later, Brian White um, more or less uh, the beginning of the 2000, uh, proved uh, a, a result uh, basically in the same spirit showing uh, uh, convexity of the rescalings by using a completely different approach. And his approach is somehow less uh, explicit but also works for weak solutions. So after the, uh, you, you can go beyond singularities. And there is an alternative proof um, by Hasselhofer and Kleiner, which uses the non-collapsing estimate by Ben Andrews in, uh, uh, well, the, the preprint appeared in uh, 2013. The, I think the paper has appeared only maybe last year on uh, CPA, CPAM. And um, I will say something about um, our 
um, original proof, which uses um, similar ideas in some, to some extent of uh, Huiskan's proof of the convex case. I will uh, give a sketch of the proof. And uh, since the proof has some technical aspects, uh, I will focus um, in the case, uh, on the case n equal 2, because we can work with the same function which I was mentioning before, that um, uh, was considered by um, Huiskan for the convex hypersurface. Um, then uh, you can see that, so what do we want to show? We want to show that uh, um, the, the curvatures, so that the smallest, we already know that the sum, we, we have just two curvatures, we know that the sum is positive, then the greatest one is uh, of course positive, the smallest one can be negative, so it, we have to show that this smallest one, this lambda one, uh, becomes asymptotically non-negative. And the uh, observation that we can uh, uh, make is that um, um, so that um, lambda 1 is uh, greater than 0 if and only if um, h square is greater than uh, a, a square because uh, in fact when you, when you are uh, in two variables uh, this is equal to the double product of lambda 1 and lambda 2 so this holds if and only if uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2 have the same sign but since uh, we have um, positive h, the, the, the same sign has to be positive. So again, uh, this means uh, that the quantity I was considering before has to be less than 1. Uh, so also here we have to look for some bound from above on, uh, on this object. And um, after some try, it turns out that um, it is convenient to introduce this function defined for uh, uh, sigma greater than zero as in the case before, but we introduce an additional parameter we define f uh, sigma eta equal to a square minus, uh, we, in principle, we would like to, to consider the difference, a square minus h square, but it is uh, convenient to add, um, to consider uh, a number slightly larger than eta, divided by, Two minus sigma, so it's the, the scale invariant expression multiplied by h sigma, so minus h sigma in the denominator, and uh, the all the proof reduces uh, um, to show that this quantity is bounded. Aim is to show for every eta greater than zero. Uh, we have uh, f sigma eta greater than some constant if sigma is small enough. It is easy to see that if we prove this, uh, C independent on T. If we can prove this, then we have proved the convexity estimate because uh, what do we deduce? We deduce that um, so f uh, sigma eta greater than 
less than or equal to C, this, uh, this means uh, A square less than uh, uh, so A square minus H square less than uh, um, eta H square plus uh, uh, C H2 minus sigma, but this is equal to 2 lambda 1 lambda 2. Um, well, then uh, uh, if uh, lambda 1 is uh, non negative, then uh, there is nothing to prove. Then uh, otherwise, uh, if uh, lambda 1 is uh, negative, then uh, lambda 2 is equal to h minus lambda 1, then this lambda 2 here is uh, greater than h. So we deduce that uh, uh, 2 lambda 1 is, uh, uh, th this is minus, minus 2 lambda 1, uh, lambda 2, because I've uh, reversed the, the order of the terms. So minus 2 lambda 1, I can divide by, by lambda 2, and I, I find that this is less than eta h plus c h 1 over sigma. Uh, but is, it is easy to see that uh, since this factor is uh, smaller than this one, you can have that this is less than uh, if I increase a bit this one, I can make the, the other one disappear. And this is the convexity estimate. I mean, this means lambda 1 is greater than or equal to, so minus uh, uh, yeah, my minus eta h minus c eta. Which is, the, which is our assertion. So the problem um, um, is equivalent, uh, in some sense, to can be reduced to find an upper bound on this function. And um, what have we done until now to bound functions in, the, in my lectures? We have uh, used maximum principle. Let's try to do the same here. And uh, we can uh, compute by the usual techniques uh, the evolution equation satisfied by this, uh, this function. And uh, we find uh, the following. We find that, um, so I omit repeating every time sigma eta, um, that this is, um, the FDT is, uh, well, I neglect some term with the right sign, um, so plus uh, 2 times uh, 1 minus sigma over h dh df. Uh, then uh, there is uh, a a term which looks uh, a bit complicated, but is uh, actually what um, will help us a lot. There are some gradient terms which can be written as the square of a suitable tensor. So I first uh, write the final term here. Um, so what does this mean? This is the squared norm of a tensor with the three indices uh, that is done in a um, standard way using the, the metric. You somehow multiply the tensor by itself and you take trace of all three indices with uh, the matrix. Uh, with, a, with, a, with a metric, 
and um, so the the tensor the, 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 is the difference of two objects that are a bit similar but uh, different. So um, basically, you have um, second fundamental form times um, gradient of the second fundamental form. But here you have the trace uh, of the um, of the zero order. So you have trace of the second fundamental form times uh, gradient of the second fundamental form without trace. And here instead you have the second fundamental form without trace times uh, the gradient of the second fundamental form with the trace. And um, in any case, this is positive, so it has the, the right sign. But this has the, definitely the, the wrong sign. And you see these terms uh, comes because of this uh, sigma here. If we don't put the sigma, we have a scale invariant expression. We have the monotonicity of this expression. But monotonicity does not let us know that it's going to 0. In this argument, we, we need uh, a power less than 1 here. If we remove the sigma, then this estimate doesn't tell us anything. So we need the sigma, but the, um, this uh, destroys the possibility of using the maximum principle. And um, as I told you, this is basically the same function that was already used with uh, so some different constant here. but. Uh, the equation is the same, uh, so the Huisken had the, the, the same difficulty in his original paper. Um, so in contrast, this was a substantial difference with the Hamilton's paper on Ricci flow. Uh, he thought of uh, finding an upper bound on F using integral estimates. So we, um, we cannot find uh, at once an upper bound on F, so an L infinity bound by the maximum principle. So let's first uh, look for LP bounds um, and hope that uh, when we integrate uh, along the surface, uh, somehow this term can be absor absorbed by the, this term and the good term coming from the Laplacian, uh, that if we compute LP norms, this gives a good term. Uh, before doing this, uh, we have to understand more this term here because um, uh, it's going to be um, uh, an important term. Um, let, let's call it, uh, let's give it a shorter name. Call this B I J K. Then uh, there is a lemma that um, by a closer study of this tensor, this is um, almost like um, a square gradient h square, but not quite uh, a square. So we have, uh, so in general dimension, we have this. Uh, estimate. Uh, this is greater than uh, um, gradient h square uh, times uh, a square without the, the, the biggest curvature. So in, uh, if n is equal to 2, this is uh, just L1 square gradient h square. Now, this seems to be a difficulty for what we want to do. I mean, um, in the case of convex hypersurfaces, then uh, all curvatures are comparable to each other. So this would be comparable to A square. But in what we are doing, lambda 1 can be, uh, can be 0. I mean, we, are not, uh, we have no convex uh, uh, surface. We, so lambda 1 can be 0. So it seems that this term can be um, as a small, uh, so that, 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 that it's of no use. I mean, it, it has the right sign, but it's not large enough to, uh, to absorb uh, bad terms. But uh, now we can exploit this um, eta in the definition of f 
because the idea here is um, to work not uh, at, uh, remember you we want to show that f is uh, bounded from above then we will only look at points where f is positive because if f is negative uh, everything is okay so we we don't need to show that for uh, those points uh, things are going well uh, we, they are going well by definition but so at uh, points uh, where uh, f is positive, what do we have? This means that a square is uh, um, yeah. uh, so what does this mean? This means that um, minus 2 lambda 1 lambda 2, this is a square minus h square is greater than eta h square. So lambda 2 is positive. This means that lambda 1 has to be negative. So this means minus 2 lambda 1 has to be greater than uh, uh, eta h. Uh, so this implies lambda. Uh, so this, this is only possible if lambda 1 is negative, then lambda 2 is greater than um, um, so lambda, no, I mean, no, yeah, okay, but, um, I don't think this is not, um, not true, but, uh, yeah, now I don't remember exactly, but anyway, this gives that, this shows that lambda 1 cannot be too close to 0. This gives um, a lower bound. This implies that lambda 1, uh, modulus of lambda 1, is, uh, um, can be used to, to prove something like this. Uh, one eta. And then this implies uh, that this term is greater than or equal to some uh, constant uh, times uh, eta square times uh, um, h square gradient h square. Uh, so th this explains why do we need uh, why we, we need this eta because uh, if eta were zero, then we would have no no estimate here. So for fixed eta, we can, uh, we can work. We will find something that depends on eta, but that, that's OK. And um, so now what we do is uh, we compute the the derivative of the LP norm of um, of f so this is um, the derivative of the argument and then there is an additional term Uh, let me write it this way, plus um, fp plus the derivative of the area element. Uh, this is uh, minus h square uh, times uh, d mu. So it is a good negative term, but I can just neglect it because... Um, will be of no use. I just say this is uh, smaller than or equal to. So I just say this. Well, then this, of course, is uh, equal to P, uh, F, P minus 1, uh, the derivative uh, of F. So what do we have? We have uh, 
We have Laplace of f. We have written the equation before. Then we have uh, minus 2 over h. Uh, no, this is the wrong one. Oh, here it is. 2 times 1, one minus sigma over h d, dh df minus, uh, well, let me, well, let me write it this way. I have called it b i j k to the square, and then we have sigma a square f. You know. Okay, and then we can uh, do some uh, partial integration. So we can uh, um, uh, bring one derivative here to the other term. So on this term we have uh, a minus sign by partial integration, the derivative of um, fp minus 1 times uh, gradient f square. So let me write it separately. Uh, then uh, I can, uh, if I again put a smaller than uh, sign there, I can bound them by with the product of the moduli. I say 1 on minus sigma is less than 1, so I write uh, 2 pi um, the h df modulus over h and uh, times uh, fp minus 1. Okay, then I use uh, my estimate here that this uh, is uh, some constant uh, eta square so I have um, a minus sign, so a good term. Oh, well, it's an inconvenient part of a blackboard for an integral estimate like this. Uh, so uh, I have uh, so minus. Uh, 2p, some 2, so this constant p over times 2c eta square p. I have, uh, well, the, the, the 2 I can uh, put it in the constant c eta square p. Um, and I have uh, dh square um, over h to the 2 minus sigma times uh, f um, uh, p minus 1. And then I have this uh, bad term here. I hope you can see it. Plus uh, sigma p a square f to the p the mu. And well, I I've ran, ran out of time, but I just want to write uh, the last step. I can, uh, I can make a Schwarz inequality, and I can absorb, uh, uh, I can produce a quadratic term here, and a quadratic, so a term which only has gradient f square, a term which only has gradient h square. So I can, um, get rid of this term, uh, I can exploit the fact that um, here I have a p square. So if I choose a weighted Schwarz inequality, so to put uh, more um, weight uh, on this gradient f square part, what I can do if I take p large enough, I can be sure that uh, in spite of this small factor here, this term is enough to absorb the rest. And I also make things uh, in order to use just the half of these two. 
to absorb this. So if um, I claim that uh, if uh, P is large enough, uh, the, the whole thing, uh, D of, on, over dt of uh, F to the P, is less than or equal to two good uh, gradient terms. Uh, let me write them like uh, P square over, let me write a four to be sure. Um, F P minus two gradient F square minus um, um, some other constant uh, C prime E to the square P um, gradient H square over H two minus sigma F two P minus one plus this uh, bad uh, reaction term here. And so the next step, which we will see tomorrow, will be how can we show that, again, for P large enough, this uh, is uh, less than, uh, can, can be absorbed by these two terms here so that this is monotone, so that we have uh, a bound on the LP norm. And so, sorry for uh, uh, being a bit later than the time, and I thank you for your attention. We will resume tomorrow.